Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here today. Um, during the pandemic, I've really realized how much I rely on talking to other people who are obsessed with the foundations of quantum mechanics, because you know, all the people around me here, um, it seems like a rather esoteric thing to think about. So I need to have these conversations to keep myself uh, sane. So I'm really glad to see um, everyone here and hope we have a good conversation today. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this idea of deriving non-contextuality inequalities from anti-distinguishability. Um, so let's start with, uh, with the boring outline slide. So um, I'm first going to give the background of where these things came from. Um, then I'll talk a bit about contextuality scenarios, probably familiar to um, everybody here, but uh, our version of it is slightly different. So uh, although I'll go through that bit quite rapidly, um, I will uh, point out the thing, the parts where we use slightly different definitions. Um, this isn't supposed to be a, a, a column heading here, but um, then I'll talk about anti-distinguishability, what that means um, and how we formulate it in contextuality scenarios. And then I, I'll be able to give the main result and then we'll give plenty of examples of these new uh, class of inequalities. Um, all right, so let's first talk about where this came from. Um, it really came from uh, the work that has been done on the reality of the wave function. So th there's the PBR theorem, um, which was trying to show that the quantum state has to be real in quantum mechanics. Um, that makes additional assumptions uh, beyond just sort of the bare ontological models framework. And so there were attempts to see what we could prove if we didn't make those additional assumptions. And then you find that at least in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, you can't rule out um, epistemic models. Um, so this led to the notion of what well, a maximally epistemic model. You don't really need to know what these things are because this is sort of just background on where these things came from. Um, and in order to try and rule out maximally epistemic models, people developed what are called overlap bounds, um, which basically show how far away from being a maximally epistemic model you have to be. Um, now, uh, one of the first things that was proved about these was that maximally epistemic models imply that the model must be quotient spec and non-contextual. So obviously, when you have a non-contextuality inequality, you, you therefore have well, when you have any proof of contextuality, you have a proof that you can't have maximally epistemic model. Um, but the inequalities, non-contextuality inequalities, actually provide uh, bounds on how far away you can be. And that was one class of, um, of overlap bounds that we had. Okay. There was another class in the literature, though, um, which was based on the concept of anti-distinguishability. This initially seemed to have nothing to do with contextuality, at least wasn't connected to any known results about contextuality. And um, since at this point, I pretty much um, exhausted what we could learn about maximally epistemic models from contextuality, I wanted to know whether this, whether this other class of bounds was really something to do with contextuality in disguise or, or whether it was something independent. So uh, what we ended up proving was that these um, were actually non-contextuality inequalities. So that's where, that's where this came from. Um, and that's uh, just to give you an idea of that. We, we didn't like just pluck this, this thing out of nowhere. It was uh, known in another field and we're just uh, uh, working out that it has to do with contextuality. So uh, now that we have this, it gives us a new method of deriving non-contextuality inequalities. Um, through which we can rederive and generalize some known inequalities. So, you know, so, some, some inequalities which hadn't been generalized before to so higher dimensions or whatever, we can, we can now do that. And for some sets of states for which there are known um, contextuality, non contextuality inequalities, we get tighter bounds with this method. So, for example, if you use um, the Cabello Severini Winter method based on orthogonality graphs, if you apply anti-distinguishability to the same set of states, then sometimes you get a, a tighter bound. 
on on the non-contextual value. Okay, so that's where it's where it's come from. Um, so let me run over the the background. So so we're going to talk in the language of contextuality scenarios. So um, this is similar to what's done in in you know Tobias Severini Winter and the paper um, by Asin et al, which are sort of very well known papers. But we did generalize it slightly. So the way that we've generalized it is that we want to allow both um, complete measurements where you have the complete set of outcomes and incomplete measurements in the same um, scenario. That turns out to be um, useful for generalizing anti-distinguishability to contextuality scenario. So what, what a contextuality scenario is, is uh, it's a structure with three elements x m and n so x is the set of outcomes so that's you know we, what we think of these contextuality scenarios is we have a bunch of different measurements that we can make um, and x is the set of outcomes that appear in any of those measurements and then we have two classes of measurements really so one we're going to call a maximal context so this m is the set of maximal contexts and this n is the set of maximal partial contexts okay so what does that mean so um, a maximal context is a subset of the outcomes um, that contains the full set of outcomes of some measurement. Okay, um, so it's a complete measurement, if you like, uh, no outcomes are missing. Um, and N, a maximal partial context, those are again subsets, uh, but we allow uh, them to be incomplete measurements, right? So. Uh, you know, maybe you're trying to model loss and uh, one of the outcomes not happening could be could mean, you know, the photon was lost in your experiment or whatever. So it's, it's the it's the set of outcomes of some measurement, but not the complete set. But these words maximal mean that uh, we want them to be the full thing. Right. So if something is a we don't take subsets of a maximal context to be a maximal partial context. It has to be something different, distinct, okay? Um, I don't know if I was very clear on that, but so if there are any questions about that definition, please, uh, please chime in. Okay, so let me give some examples. Uh, some of these will be familiar. So, um, right, so what I'm doing here is the outcomes of these dots and, um, and I'm drawing this, it's really sort of like a hypergraph with two kinds of edges now. Um, the solid lines denote uh, maximal contexts and the dotted lines denote maximal partial contexts. By the way, I'm probably just gonna start calling these contexts and partial contexts here as well, just for simplicity. Um, so, so here are the sort of classical examples. So you have a classical contextuality scenario. This just means there's one measurement, one possible measurement you can do, and one of these outcomes, one of these five outcomes has to occur. And if we look at the partial classical contextuality scenario, it, the, again, um, this is the, I only have one partial context here, and um, either one of these outcomes has to occur or no, none of those outcomes occurs, right? So that's the difference between these two. Uh, we have the famous example of, this, uh, of Sorry, that's my email chiming in. Um, we, have, we have the famous example of the Specker triangle. Um, this is just has, has maximal, has context and no partial context. And uh, this example down here is going to be the stereotypical example of anti-distinguishability. Um, that's why I've included it here. So you have a context and then we have uh, a bunch of partial context. So you can have contextuality scenarios which have both of them in. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Right. So, um, well, uh, we can construct these things from quantum mechanics, of course. So a quantum contextuality scenario is one that's going to come from Hilbert space in some sense. So uh, the set of outcomes will be represented by a set of pure states, rays, if you like, in Hilbert space. Um, and then we look at that set and we try to identify what the contexts and partial contexts are. So if you find in that set that you've got a complete orthonormal basis, 
that's a context. And if you find that you have a set that contains pairwise orthogonal states, but isn't a basis, and you can't complete it by adding more states in X, so the, the full basis isn't, isn't included in X, then that will be uh, a partial context, okay? So, you know, if I consider these uh, six vectors, for instance, then, and look at the orthogonality relations that exist there, we can see, okay, um, what this set of three is an orthonormal basis. So that is a context. And then you can also see that these two are orthogonal, these two are orthogonal, and these two are orthogonal, but there's no way of completing any of those into, into a full basis. So those are gonna be partial contexts. And this is a way of generating that anti-distinguishability scenario um, out of quantum mechanics. Okay, so, uh, right. So now we want to talk about what we mean by contextuality and non-contextuality in this setting. So um, first we have the concept of a value function. So a value function just assigns uh, a value zero or one to every outcome in the scenario, okay? And it has to satisfy the following rules. So whenever you have a context, complete context, then exactly one of the outcomes in that context must be assigned the value one, the rest assigned the value zero. And if you have a partial context, then at most one has to be assigned the value one. So you could have them all assigned value zero. Um, okay, so, so yeah. So the reason why this is value functions are non-contextual is that they are defined directly on the outcomes. In principle, you could imagine that, uh, let's go back to the examples, you can imagine that say in the speck of triangle that the value assigned to A is different if you're measuring in this context than if you're measuring in this context. But because we just assign values to outcomes and it's not a function of the context, um, these are non-contextual value assignments. Okay, there's a value function. Um, you can also, assign quantum mechanical models to them. Now, I know I've already talked about generating contextuality scenarios from quantum mechanics. That's slightly different from having a quantum model, right? So the, the contextuality scenario may come from quantum mechanics, it may come from somewhere else. And then you can talk about whether we can model that in quantum mechanics. Um, so a quantum model will just be, well, you have to choose a Hilbert space and then for every outcome will be associated to a projection operator onto a closed subspace, such that whenever you have a, a context, you get a full projection valued measure. So those projectors sum to the identity. And if you have a partial context, then you don't require that they sum to the identity, you just require that distinct um, outcomes get assigned to orthogonal uh, subspaces. Okay, so obviously, if I if I if I make a, a contextuality scenario out of quantum mechanics, then we know it always has a quantum model. But other contextuality scenarios may or may not have a quantum models, and they may or may not have value functions. Um, okay, so now let's talk about the concept of a state. So a state is really, uh, a, you know, the generalization of a probability distribution to contextuality scenario. It's supposed to represent the uh, probabilities that you would observe for the outcomes in some experiment. So a state um, assigns a probability to every outcome. Now, if we have a, a, a complete context or context, then those probabilities have to sum to one over that context. And if we have a partial context, they have to sum to less than or equal to one. Okay, so we denote the set of states by S, SC here. And then of course, there are the special classes of states. Oh, I, here are just some examples first. So if we go back to um, the examples that we had, right. So if we look at the uh, classical contextuality scenario, a state on this will be just be a classical probability distribution. For the partial contextuality scenario, it will be a subnormalized probability distribution, right? So the probabilities don't have 
have to sum up to less than one because it, there's some probability that the outcome that you're not modeling um, will happen. Um, the Specker triangle here has exactly one state. Uh, you know, you, you just solve the linear equalities defining the state and you find that the only possibility is that all three outcomes are assigned value half, probability of half rather. Okay, so those are just some examples. Right, um, so now we look at the special classes of states. So first of all, the quotient specker non-contextual states. These have to come from value assignments is the idea. So um, what you do is you take a probability distribution over the set of value functions, right? So the idea here is that um, what you're observing in the experiment is one of the value functions, right? So there's a deterministic and non-contextual assignment of, of values. You just don't know which one. So the things that you observe will be generated from some probability distribution over the value functions, okay? So the set of quotient spec and non-contextual states, I'm going to denote C for classical, um, and a state, and you know, there are states that are not um, quotient spec and non-contextual, and those are going to be called the contextual states, okay? So they can't be modeled as if there was a value function that really applied. And the, the state on the Specker triangle is an example of that. Um, there are no value functions on the Specker triangle, so that state cannot come from uh, a non-contextual value function. All right, uh, and then of course we'll have quantum states. So a quantum state is one where you have a quantum model, so you've assigned uh, projective measurements to all of your contexts, and then there's some density operator on the Hilbert space such that the um, probabilities are given by the Born rule as in quantum mechanics. So we have the set of quantum states. And now um, we, you know, every single talk on this kind of stuff has this diagram in it, right? So, you know, the set of states forms a convex polytope, the set of quantum states is a convex set which isn't a polytope. And the set of classical quotient specker states is another polytope, and they are included in, in, in each other like this. And those are strict inclusions in general for a general contextuality scenario. Okay, so um, what we're mostly going to be interested in, of course, like states that are outside this classical set in this green or yellow region are the contextual states. And we're going to mostly be looking at examples. Of, of, of states that you can generate in quantum mechanics. So in the green region here. All right, so just briefly, um, we need to talk about what we mean by non-contextuality inequality. Well, it's just a linear inequality that applies to, to the states. So the, I'm gonna talk about two classes so we can have a state independent contextuality inequality, non-contextuality inequality. And I want to, briefly point out here to avoid confusion, the notion of state independent and state dependent I'm using here is different from the notion of a state independent and state dependent proof of contextuality. Okay, so let me say what I mean here. A state independent inequality is a linear inequality which is satisfied for all quotient spec and non-contextual states. And a state dependent non-contextuality inequality is one that satisfied not for all patient spec and non-contextual states, but for patient spec and non-contextual states that satisfy some additional constraint. So that additional constraint might be something like a particular outcome has to be assigned the value one. Okay. So this is this is distinct from state independent and state dependent proofs where um, they really have to do more with the quantum model, right? So uh, a state uh, independent proof is one for which um, every single quantum state gives the same value, gives the same probability, uh, sorry, gives the same value for the inequality, um, whereas a state dependent one, uh, some states are contextual, some states are non-contextual, right? So those two notions are distinct. All right, um, so now let's get on to sort of the meat and talk about uh, anti-distinguishability. So 
since uh, the notion for a contextuality scenario is sort of a little bit abstract, I find it helps to talk about this in the context of quantum mechanics first, um, where things are clear. So we'll talk about what anti-distinguishability means um, for quantum mechanics and then generalize to contextuality scenarios. So we have a d-dimensional Hilbert space and we have some set A1 to An of um, of states. There may be fewer states here than the dimension of the, the Hilbert space. Okay, So we call that, that set anti-distinguishable if there is an orthonormal basis. There's an orthonormal basis with, with D states, and these are denoted with perp, uh, such that if we look at the first n elements of this basis, they are, um, they are orthogonal so A1 perp is orthogonal to A1, A2 perp is orthogonal to A2, and so on, all the way up to N. And then since N might be less than D, there's still some states left over in the basis. And all of those extra states have to be orthogonal to every single one of these states. So this is sort of just saying that uh, these states A1 and AN live in the subspace spanned by A1 perp to AN perp. Okay, so, so you can give this an operational meaning. Um, let's first of all think about the case n equals d because that's straightforward, we don't have to worry about this. What does this say? So in the context of distinguishability, if a set of states is perfectly distinguishable, it means that if you prepare one of those states or someone prepares one of those states, then you can do a measurement which tells you exactly which one of those states was prepared. That's distinguishability. In anti-distinguishability, it's kind of the opposite. If someone prepares one of the states A1 to AN, then you can do a measurement which will rule out exactly one of those states. So if you get the outcome AJ perp, then you know for sure that AJ wasn't prepared. So it's a weaker notion than distinguishability, actually. And um, if D is larger than N, then we have this condition to avoid triviality, right? Because um, if if your states all live in a subspace, then uh, you know, getting an outcome that's not in that subspace rules out all of them. So anti-distinguishability would be trivial. So we demand that um, we demand that basically uh, this subspace is things are trivial on this additional subspace. That makes it a non-trivial notion. Um, okay, so let's first give an example, and it's the, the same example that I've used before, um, right? So notice A1 perp, A2 perp, A3 perp is an orthonormal basis, complete orthonormal basis. Um, and we have that, the, that A1 perp is orthogonal to A1, A2 perp is orthogonal to A2, A3 perp is orthogonal to A3. So if you prepare one of these three states, A1, A2, A3, um, then if you perform this measurement, the perp measurement, then whichever outcome you get, you can rule out one of those three states. So this is, this is weaker than distinguishability because you know, these three states don't have to be orthogonal here. It's, uh, it's a more general thing. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Um, now there's a very useful um, theorem that, that, well, that um, characterizes three-way anti-distinguishability in quantum mechanics. Okay, so this we can use, and we do use extensively to check um, the anti-distinguishabilities of states need, needed for our, our proofs, our inequalities. So if you have a set of three states, then um, if you look at the mod squared inner products of every pair of those states, then there's a, a couple of inequalities that you have to check, easy enough to do. If you check these inequalities, this is a these are necessary and sufficient conditions for these three states to be anti-distinguishable. So this is useful because it means that, you know, unlike in this example, in this example, I, I explicitly constructed the perp states. And you don't have to do that. I could just take these three states, A1, A2, A3, stick them into this inequality here, and check whether they're anti-distinguishable without actually constructing the, the basis that does the anti-distinguishing. And there's also uh, another sufficient condition which is useful. If these inner products are all less than a quarter 
Um, you can check that this corollary works by just um, sticking uh, that these are less than or equal to a quarter in this in these and show that it satisfies these inequalities. That's easy enough to do, but this is uh, a slightly simpler condition to check. Um, so sometimes it's more useful to, to see that things are anti-distinguishable. Uh, do you have an intuition for this theorem? Like is the, the fact that the sums are all less than one just says that no two of them are particularly close together. Yeah. And the second condition Second condition is, I, I don't know, more difficult to interpret <laughs> what it means. Okay. Um, there, I mean, there are, there is a sort of geometric, so Teiko Hainasari has a paper about uh, sort of geometric, uh, a geometric condition. It's a little bit sort of different from this. Um, so, you know, you can sort of see that, um, well, the state, so if you have three anti-distinguishable states, you know, at least for a qubit, if you think about it, on the block sphere, if you draw sort of the triangle that they inscribe in the, in the block sphere, it has to include the identity, otherwise you won't be able to construct the anti-distinguishing measurement. Um, and so you have sort of a geometry like that, generalized in higher dimensions. And, and so I should also mention here that, um, you know, from a practical point of view, if you want to check anti-distinguishabilities even with higher numbers of states, or even generalized to mixed states, because you can generalize these concepts to mixed states, that can be formulated as a semi-definite program. So you can uh, efficiently check whether things are anti-distinguishable, again, without having to do an exhaustive search for the anti-distinguishing basis. Um, but the geometry does get more complicated. It's interesting. Um, I haven't thought, about, thought too deeply about the, the interpretation of these inequalities. All right, um, so that's just to show that it's easy to check. Now, I need to generalize this to contextuality scenarios. I really need to close my email so that I stop getting noises uh, like that. Um, okay, so again, I'm gonna say a set of outcomes in a, in a contextuality scenario is anti-distinguishable if there exists another set of outcomes, A1, A2 to AN perp, now there needs to exist a context. So this is like the complete orthonormal basis. There should, there should exist a context in which these things are, are a subset of it, right? So again, just like in quantum theory, the things might not span the whole Hilbert space. So there may be some extra outcomes in this context, but it's important that this is a, a full context and not a partial context here. Uh, so for each J, for each one of these things, there has to exist a context or a maximal partial context, could be either, such that um, this pair is in it, okay? So this is like saying, okay, A1 is gonna be orthogonal to A1 per, et cetera. So there has to be, there has to be some measurement which has both of those things as, as mutually exclusive outcomes. And then um, again, this context M may have more outcomes in than just A1 to AN. And so for each of those extra outcomes, uh, you need to have sort of an orthogonality with every single one of these, right? So there needs to be some measurement, whether it's a context with, or, or partial context, doesn't matter, but um, they need to be mutually exclusive outcomes. So this is just sort of ruling out the triviality case where um, everything's on, on that other subspace. So this is just uh, paralleling the definition that we have in, in quantum mechanics. Um, all right, so now we're in a position to look at how we use these things to construct non-contextuality inequalities. And I have to unfortunately throw one more abstract definition at you. Um, last time I gave this talk, it was confusing. So I don't want to start with an example. So I'm gonna talk about the concept of a pairwise anti-set. So I'm gonna start well, I can only really draw very easily what we call a weak pairwise anti-set, okay? So these are all supposed to be outcomes. These A1, A2, A3, and C are all outcomes in my contextuality scenario. And um, A1, A2, and A3 together, this set W is what we call a weak pairwise anti-set. So what does it mean? It means that there's some other outcome, C, which we call the principal outcome in the contextuality scenario, such that, um, 
these uh, sets here represent, the different colored sets represent anti-distinguishabilities. So every pair of outcomes in the, in the set W, together with the third outcome, the principal outcome, has to be an anti-distinguishable set. Okay, so every single one with C. A1, A2, C, A1, A3, C, A2, A3, C. All have to be anti-distinguishable. So that's what we mean by uh, pairwise anti-set, weak pairwise anti-set. Um, so pairwise means that it's every pair in this set with some other outcome outside the set. Okay, so, so let me define that formally. A weak pairwise anti-set is a set of outcomes such that there exists some other outcome in the contextuality scenario, such that for every pair in the set, together with that third, together with that third um, outcome is anti-distinguishable. And we call that C a uh, principal outcome. Um, and now we can strengthen that notion as well. Um, so there's a notion of a strong pairwise anti-set where this is true, not just for a single principal outcome, but for an entire context of outcomes, right? So, so this is now true, not just for a single outcome C, but for every outcome C in some context, okay? I hope it's clear what those uh, definitions mean. It's, these things are kind of hard to draw in diagrams because there's so many anti-distinguishabilities required. Um, so now I can present the main result. Um, so consider a pairwise anti-set in some contextuality scenario. If it's a strong pairwise anti-set, then if you sum the probabilities assigned to all of the, all of the outcomes in the pairwise anti-set, that must be less than or equal to one in a non-contextual model. And if it's a weak pairwise anti-set, then this is true only for states that assign a probability one to, to the principal outcome. So um, if you have a strong pairwise anti-set, you get a state independent inequality. If you have a weak pairwise anti-set, then you get a state dependent inequality. Okay. So before going into a proof or anything like that, we'll see, we'll see how much of the proof we have time for. I want to give you a bunch of examples of how this works. So you'll see examples of these, these pairwise anti-sets. So the simplest example is just the UO inequality. So this is a well-known inequality, uh, non-contextuality inequality, which we can rederive by this method. So we consider these following four vectors here right, these four vectors, and these vectors form a strong pairwise anti-set where this C1, C2, C3 is the principal context. So this is an orthonormal basis. This is obviously a quantum um, contextuality scenario. So th th these form a context, and you can see that it's really just take using the states from the example I was giving. So A1, A2, A3, together with C1, um, was the example of anti-distinguishability I gave earlier. Let's go back to that so we can see. Uh, right. Yeah, so forget the perp states, A1, A2, and A3 here. Well, okay, in my new example, this is, this is C, this is, and these are two of the A's. Okay, so we know from this example that these three are anti-distinguishable. So if I go back to here, Right, it was, let's see, A1, A2, and C1 here form an anti-distinguishable set. Um, by the symmetry of this situation, the same is gonna be true of any pair, but or you can just plug the values into those inequalities uh, I gave you and see that, that it's true. So, so for every one of these Cs, um, every pair here together with any of these Cs is an anti-distinguishable triple. Okay, so you have that structure, and then our result tells us that uh, these j's here should be aj. So it should be the probabilities assigned to, some of the probabilities assigned to these four states has to be less than or equal to one by our main result. And then, um, you know, in the quantum model, um, you see that, that, the, that these projectors sum up to the 
Morphos times the identity. So this is actually a state independent proof as well. Um, so you get a value in quantum mechanics, which is greater than one. So that's a, a proof of contextuality. And that's really the simplest example. Now, um, in the original UO paper, the way this was derived is they look at the orthogonality to gra graph of 13 rays and Hilbert space. And then you, you look at, well, okay, what are all the value functions on that, et cetera, and, and derive the inequality. In, in the way that I just proved it, I only made use of seven, seven states, seven rays. Um, it's a cheat to say it's a smaller proof because actually, you know, the other six states in the 13 ray orthogonality graph are just the perp states that uh, do the anti distinguishing. But, you know, we didn't actually have to construct them to make the proof. Um, and also, uh, realizing that there's this anti distinguishability structure uh, enables you to generalize the proof into higher dimensions uh, more easily. So let's do that. Um, and the way to do that is to look at the Hadamard states. So if I go back and look at the UO states here, it's really just every single state in three dimensions where, you know, ignoring the normalization factor, the magnitude of each uh, element is one. And then, and then you have all possible combinations of plus one and minus one. Now, uh, there's another four states where I multiply all these vectors by minus one, but those represent the same rate. Okay. So those are all the possibilities. So to generalize that into, into D dimensions, you look at, uh, take a binary string, a string of zeros and ones, and just for every binary string, there's one of these vectors. So the, each of these components is either plus one or minus one, and you take all possible combinations. Um, now this obviously contains two copies of each ray. I'm working in a real Hilbert space here, so it's two copies. So you should remove the duplicate. So every, every two vectors that are the same up to a factor of minus one, you don't really need both of them in the, in the set. And then you, uh, you construct the um, principal basis with just like the standard basis vectors, just like for, for the UO proof. So you can check that all of the inner products here satisfy the inequalities. And so what we actually get is this. So why is this two here rather than one? It's just because I've decided to sum over all of the binary strings here, not just half, half of them. So each ray is included twice. So our result says that this has to be less than or equal to two. And then again, you have a state independent proof because you can check that um, the projectors onto these states um, are proportional to the identity, two to the D over D. So the quantum value is two to the D over D, which gives you a contextuality, non-contextuality inequality for D greater than or equal to three. Okay. And that's, so the direct generalization of the UO proof. Now, um, these Hadamard states have been considered before, uh, even including, well, by various people, including me. And you can also apply the CSW method to them. So you can take the Hadamard states and look at their orthogonality graph. And then you apply something called the frankel roedel theorem, and you get a non-contextuality inequality like this with a much larger bound. It's still violated by quantum mechanics, but the, the non-contextual bound is larger. So actually by considering the anti-distinguishability properties of the same set of states, we're getting a much tighter bound. Um, again, it's a little bit of a cheat because there are really all these other states around doing the, the anti-distinguishing bases, which we haven't constructed. They are involved in the proof. So there's a larger number of rays and if you wanted to think of this as an orthogonality graph type of proof, there's a bunch of rays which are being assigned weight zero in the inequality, but are playing a role in the proof. But nonetheless, um, just by looking at the anti-distinguishability properties rather than the distinguishability properties, we immediately get uh, a much tighter bound. And I have to say that, you know, I didn't pull this result out of thin air. It was originally pointed out to me by Owen Moroni, and it was in a paper by Cyril Brankyard, again, as overlap bounds on the reality of the quantum state. So uh, the new thing here is to realize that we can uh, port these things over and, and 
view them as non-contextuality inequalities. Okay, so let's look at a couple of other examples. Um, mutually unbiased bases, probably most of you know what they, those are. Um, so two orthonormal bases are mutually unbiased if the inner products between every vector in this basis and every vector in that basis are all the same, one over D. And what's known is that uh, if we have a prime power, if D is a prime power, then there are D, exactly D plus one mutually unbiased bases that you can find. So what we can do is we can take those D plus one mutually unbiased bases and construct um, a strong pairwise anti-set from them, okay? So let's let our A vectors be all of, all of the vectors that appear in one of these bases. So J is gonna run over the choice of basis from one to D plus one, and K is gonna run over the vectors within a basis from one to D. Now I need to construct a principal context so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take one of these um, bases out of the set. Let's say we take the A1K basis out of the set, and that's going to be our principal context. So we have uh, now, so we've taken one of the bases. So we've got D bases left, each, of, each with D states. There are D squared um, vectors left in our set. And that's a strong pairwise anti-set with um, it's a strong pairwise anti-set when D is four or greater. So remember the simple condition to check for anti-distinguishability, the corollary um, is it here. If all, the, if all the inner products are less than or equal to a quarter, all the mod squared inner products are less than or equal to a quarter, then you have anti-distinguishability. So um, if we go back to this example, If we go back to this example, um, if all of these, well, if D is four or larger, then you, you're satisfied anti-distinguishability because all the inner products are four. Okay, so, uh, so that's what I'm just saying here. Um, also, however, since these states are a basis, they form a maximal context. So for any state, if I sum the probabilities over, over that basis, I'll get one. So I can take the inequality I get for the D squared, I can add these guys back in and sum over all the mutually unbiased bases and now get two, okay? So, so we get one from the D squared states, plus we get an additional one if we add these states back in. And now if you have, uh, since you have D plus one bases, each basis sums up to the identity, the projectors. So if we add them, D plus one of those will get D plus one times the identity. So again, we have a state independent proof where the quantum value is um, D plus one. Now this is actually larger, you know, even for D equals two, this is larger, but remember that the anti-distinguishability doesn't hold unless D is greater than or equal to four. So this only gives us a contextuality proof for D greater than or equal to four. And again, this inequality, you know, although I believe it's a new context, non-contextuality inequality, it was derived, comes from an overlap bound that was derived uh, previously. Um, now, here's another one we can just um, take, so things, things which have uh, sort of a nice spread out geometry of is like mobs uh, are good. So symmetric information in complete POVMs or Six. I still call them six rather than seeks because uh, there is a sickness which is which has tried to find uh, six in all dimensions, which can uh, destroy somebody's career by giving you a problem to obsess obsess about. So I call them these sick POVMs. Um, <clears throat> There's just a POVM. So we have a set of d squared uh, positive operators that sum to the identity. They're all proportional to projectors. And the inner product, they're all proportional to one dimensional projectors, I should say. And the, and the inner product of, of each of these states that appears in the POVM is the same. Okay. So we know, you know, a lot of people suspect that these exist in all finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, but we know that analytically, even that they exist up to dimension 151. And it's, they've been shown to exist in a number of higher dimensions as well. But showing that six exist in all dimensions of Hilbert space is, a, is an open problem. 
Um, anyway, <coughs> we know that they exist in a lot of dimensions. So what we're going to do is, in this case, we're going to construct a weak pairwise anti-set because I haven't figured out a way to find a, um, a basis uh, that, that could be a princi principal context. So we're just going to have one state. So we're going to, what we're going to do is I'm just going to take one of the one of the states out of the set, let's say A1, and we'll keep all the rest in our state W. Now this is a weak pairwise anti-set if D is greater than or equal to three, because all of the inner products there are one over D plus one. So if D is three, this will be four, this will be a quarter, and as you increase D, it only uh, gets smaller. So, um, so that's a weak pairwise anti-set. And so, now we can do the same thing. Okay, so basically, because um, this is only going to hold, the inequality that we're going to get is only going to hold uh, for the state C. But the, but if you if you have the state C, and you measure a the the, the seek P over, if you measure a basis that includes a one on it, you'll always get a one because it is a one. Right, the inner product with itself is one. So if I if I do the inequality over the set W, then I can add back in A1 and get two here. Okay, uh, this is state state uh, state dependent because it only holds for states such that WC is one. Okay, so but from the definition of the of the seek, we know that the sum of these projectors because because um, basically these projectors sum to the identity, but because they're each one over D times these one dimensional projectors, you'll get D times the identity. So the quantum predictions are always gonna be D. Um, so such a state, a state, a quantum state, which also satisfies WC, omega C is one, A1 being an example of such a state, this will be contextual for D greater than or equal to three. Now this inequality, the D equals three version of this inequality has appeared in the literature. Um, it was derived actually as a state independent inequality. So in that case, it's state independent. And it was derived using a special relationship that exists in dimension three between seeks and mobs. Now, from our perspective, those mobs, the mobs are the bases that anti-distinguish the appropriate triples of, of seeks. Right, that, that's what that special relationship is. The required anti-distinguishabilities between the, the seek vectors um, still hold in higher dimensions. It's just that it's no longer mutually unbiased bases that are doing the anti-distinguishing. So that's, you know, because we were using anti-distinguishability, we're able to generalize this to higher dimensions. Um, however, I wasn't able to make it, at least not yet, haven't been able to make this state independent. Um, the difficulty is, you know, when we had mobs, each of the mobs is a basis, so I could just take out the basis and that was a context. Uh, for, this, for the seeks, there's no obvious um, way of constructing a, a context such that all of the anti-distinguishabilities you need hold. Uh, so that's why this one was state dependent. I'm still um, optimistic that you could make this into a state independent proof, perhaps, uh, in an, using another method. Okay, so there's examples I wanted to look at. Um, I don't know. I've been told by mathematicians that you should always include some a proof in your in your talk. So we have a few minutes. So I actually I should ask. Do you want me to stop before nine o'clock or or at nine o'clock? No, it's up to you. You can continue. If nobody's bored, then I'll I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll go into a little bit of the proof. Um, so I'm just going to prove it for the strong pairwise anti-set case. The reasoning for the weak case is similar, so I don't want to repeat myself. Okay, so let's suppose we have a, a, a quotient spec and non-contextual state. We know that it's a convex combination of value functions, basically. So uh, the first thing you always do in these things is you realize that um, because it's a convex combination of value functions, this uh, this linear combination here, sorry, it's raining very hard in California, which is unusual. You might be able to hear that on the, on the background. Um, this is uh, less than or equal to 
the maximum that a value function assigns to the sum of these things. So we just have to say, so if this is gonna be less than or equal to one, then we just have to prove that for any value function, at most one of the, uh, at most one of the outcomes in the anti-set, in the pairwise anti-set can have value one and the rest have to have value zero. That's rel relatively e easy to do. So by way of contradiction, let's just assume that two outcomes in the anti-set are assigned, both assigned value one. Then we choose a principal context. Since it's a context, every value assumption, every value function must assign exactly one of those, one of the um, outcomes in that context, the value one. So let's look at that C, which is assigned the value one. Okay, now we, we look at the definition of a strong pairwise anti-set. Well, it tells us that um, A, A prime and C have to be anti-distinguishable. If they're anti-distinguishable, then there's a context containing these perp, these three perp outcomes, perp to A, perp to A prime and perp to C, such that there are partial contexts, possibly partial contexts containing A, A perp, A prime, A prime perp, C, C perp. Okay, so those are, those are partial contexts. And remember that, um, uh, let's see, let's see, A, A prime and C are all assigned value one. So we know that A perp, A perp prime and C perp have to be assigned the value zero. Now also, if there are other outcomes in this M prime, then they're, um, then they have to be uh, in context or partial context with A, A prime and C. So again, uh, well, okay, let, 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 me, let me run through the proof here. So these are the three facts we know from anti-distinguishability. Yeah, so as I said, the second item here and the fact that A, A prime and C are assigned value one means that the perps are all assigned the value zero. But since M prime is a context, the perp context, then there must exist some X other than a prime, a, a, other than these three perp outcomes that is assigned value one. But um, X is, if you like, orthogonal to both A, to all of A, A prime and C. So that would imply that, for example, V of A should be zero because it's in a context with X, but that contradicts our assumption that it was one, okay? So, so therefore, uh, you can't have more than one of these, more than one of, uh, more than one outcome in the set W being assigned the value one. So that's the proof. Okay, um, so to conclude, um, what we've seen is that anti-distinguishability can be used to derive non-contextuality inequalities. So sometimes this leads to new inequalities, which I haven't seen before in the literature, or to generalizing known inequalities to higher dimensions. And in some cases, you, if you use anti-distinguishability, you'll get tighter bounds on a particular set of, of states than, uh, than were known before. Um, future work. So, you know, everybody wants their inequalities to be experimentally robust in one way or the other these days. Um, I think this is, would be a difficult task for this particular set because you would have to verify the anti-distinguishabilities. So you'd have to reintroduce all those perp bases uh, and measure those as well. So these proofs would end up getting quite large. In principle, you could robustify them by any of the methods that have been applied to standard um, non-contextuality inequalities. Um, since we revealed that the structure of anti-distinguishability is, is useful here, where I thought, well, everything I did here involved three-way anti-distinguishability, right? So you have a pair, these pairwise anti-sets, which with a third outcome are anti-distinguishable. Can you get anything from four-way anti-distinguishability or higher anti-distinguishability? I spent some time thinking about this, whether we could, you know, get even perhaps even tighter bounds on the Hadamard states by looking at four-way indistinguishabilities, for instance, haven't got anywhere with it, but I suspect that there might be something there. Um, the seek inequality that we have, I suspect could be made state independent, but uh, I just don't know how to do it. And um, I do also want to mention that anti-distinguishability has been applied. Well, there are various quantum, sort of quantum game, quantum communication games, which are based on anti-distinguishability in the literature. 
Um, and there's also a result in quantum computing um, by Angela Karanji, which shows that uh, you can use anti-distinguishabilities and contextuality inequalities to bound the memory of a Clifford, uh, required to simulate a Clifford circuit um, for stabilizer states. Um, since by our method, we know how to derive contextuality for non-stabilizer states, I wonder whether we can use uh, more general anti-distinguishabilities now to bound um, the memory required for quantum computations or um, other sets, other, other kinds of circuits. Um, so I would really like to try and apply these inequalities to, to some concrete problem in quantum computing, but we haven't uh, done that yet. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for, for your attention. <laughs>